first, I want to thank, thank the organizers again for um, bringing me here, and I also want to curse you until the end of your days for having me speak last. Um, um, a few months ago, I wrote to Aaron uh, Schuster asking, so I, know, I knew he was working on Kafka's dog, whether he would be speaking about it, and I said, I'll, I'll do something else, but he didn't write back, so I'm speaking about Kafka's dog. Um, I'm sorry for the repetition, but um, I'll actually be talking more about the story and less about <clears throat> the more general kinds of issues. But it was such a tour de force performance that I almost gave up and you know, chose some, to something else, but I, it was too hard to do. The, the title is His Master's Missing Voice. This may seem like a trivial matter in comparison with all the changes taking place in contemporary language use with respect to gender and sexuality. But at present, though it's still acceptable to say good boy and good girl to one's dog, there is no longer a good word to refer to oneself in relation to one's dog. In English, the options are pretty much master, owner, or somewhat embarrassingly, mommy and daddy. Um, you know, I'll say to, I'll say to, no, mommy's gonna walk you today. Mommy's walking you, go to mommy. In German, the traditional term is Herr, or Herren, a word also used, of course, to refer to the ultimate lord and master. Stray dogs are referred to as Herrenlos, dogs lacking a master. The vague discomfort many now feel with all these words suggests, I think, that the historical attenuation of the traditional figure of the master has now infected interspecies relations. Dominion over the animals is simply no longer admissible and I think that's really the opening of animal studies, new materialism, and so on. Because people don't want to say this, you know, I'm the master. <laughs> In the following, I'd like to offer some remarks on Kafka's unfinished prose work, Forschung in eines Hundes, which is at some level a thought experiment concerning the prospect of a fully herrenlose Hundeschaft, or at least one in which the name of the master has been fully foreclosed. I'm sorry, I have a cough drop. I hope it's not um, interfering with the intelligibility. The story is presented as a kind of memoir of an aging dog reflecting on his choice as a young dog to pursue the life of the mind, one de dedicated to research, to a certain kind of theoretical activity, rather than sharing the life of a common, the common life of dogs. He confesses that this choice set him upon a difficult path. Why won't I behave like the others, live in harmony with my kind, silently accept whatever disturbs that harmony, overlook it as a little mistake in the great reckoning, and turn forever toward what binds us happily together, and not toward what, time and again, irresistibly, of course, tears us out of the circle of our kind. In hindsight, the narrator dog seems to realize that such disturbances to the harmony of dogdom, of Hundeschaft, point not to contingent and determinant errors, but to a more fundamental errancy grounded in a structural glitch in the constitution of the species. <clears throat> On closer scrutiny, I soon find that something was not quite right from the beginning, that a little fracture, eine kleine Bruchstelle, was in place. He notes a slight uneasiness, ein leichtes Unbehagen. He notes that a slight uneasiness would come, would come over him, not only in the midst of the collective, but also in more intimate settings, indeed, that the mere sight of another dog could throw him into a sense of helplessness and despair. Call it Unbehagen in der Hundekultur, with a touch of canine self-hatred. He goes on to recall the event, I'm sorry, I have to spit out this cough drop. It's kind of gross, but. Um, he goes on to recall the event that first set him on the course of his researches. It was an encounter with a group of seven dogs who engaged in a kind of dance set to a clamorous music that seems to come from nowhere, a, a music ex nihilo. They did not speak, they did not sing. In general, they held their tongue with almost a certain doggedness, but eine gewissen Verbissenheit. But they conjured forth music out of the empty space. At a certain point, the music becomes overwhelming. You could attend to nothing but this music that came from all sides, from the heights, from the depths, from everywhere, pulling the listener into its midst, pouring over him, crushing him, and even, and 
and even after annihilating, annihilating him, still blaring its fanfare, fanfares at such close range that they turned remote. In solcher Nähe, das es schon ferne war. The young narrator dog's obsession with this for him deeply enigmatic, not to say traumatic encounter, I, I, I like to call this Musiktrauma, um, not to say traumatic encounter is what ultimately alienates him from dogdom and sets him on his course of, of a re, as a researcher with the aim of, as he puts it, solving it absolutely by dint of research so as finally to gain a new view of ordinary, quite happy everyday life. As he then adds, I have sub subsequently worked the same way, even, with, even if with less childish means, but the difference is not very great, and I persist stubbornly to this day. Be that as it may, the dogged pursuit of a sort of absolute canine knowledge begins with questions close to hand, questions pertaining to the most basic of canine, the most basic needs of canine life. I began my investigations at that time with the simplest things. I began to investigate what dogdom, um, what dogdom took as nourishment. The research concerns the question of the source of food, where food comes from. Does it come from the earth? Does it come down from the sky? Can dogs influence the appearance of food? Though these are questions that apparently have concerned canine scholars for generations, a young researcher admitting the limits of his capacity for proper scientific study pursues such questions more or less on his own without consulting the authorita authoritative, call them canonical sources. A first conclusion would have it that dogs' main, this is his research, that dogs' main food stuff indeed comes from the earth, but that for still unknown reasons, the, um, the, the earth needs dogs to help with its production. Quote, we find this food on the ground, but the ground needs our water. He adds, he adds that the appearance of food has been known to be accelerated by means of certain incantations, songs, and movements. Later in the story, our canine researcher entertains an opposing opinion, when seemingly supported by empirical evidence that food comes not from the ground, but rather from above, and is only brought down to earth by, the, by way of the said, canine incanta the said canine rituals. At this point in the story, if not much sooner, the reader recognizes its fundamental conceit, namely that dogs live amid human beings who for some reason remain invisible to them. Put another way, the dogs live as if human beings did not exist and are thus forced to contend with a multiplicity of phenomena and that must remain enigmatic to them or can be explained only by way of empirically noted regularities. Dogs pee, dogs find food on the ground, dogs bark, howl, moan, the so-called incantations, dogs find food on the ground. The story's conceit becomes completely obvious when the narrator dog, discussing the odd variety of occupations in which dogs are employed, mentions the air dogs, the Lufthunde. This term, adapted from Luftmensch, the Yiddish expression for a dreamy, impractical person with no visible means of assistance, clearly refers here to small lap dogs who, instead of being walked, are carried around by their invisible masters. Uh, in hindsight, it becomes clear that the encounter that set him on his path as a researcher was a group of trained dogs performing, perhaps in a park or public square, to the accompaniment of human musicians. We feel confident the answer, that the answer to that first enigma, who was forcing them to do what they were doing here, is a rather straightforward one. Straightforward one. They're human masters. Returning to the main question the narrator dog pursues, namely where food comes from, the story would seem to suggest that the Bruchstelle, or fracture in the constitution of dogdom, is connected to the lack of a concept of providence. That is, that food is provided for them by the good graces of human beings. That they are, as domestic animals, as members of the oikos, dependent on their masters for care and nurturance. One might think of it as a thought experiment. What happens when a region of being is foreclosed from one's picture of the world. Kafka seems here to be revealing 
by way of allegory, the sorts of uncanny enigmas and paradoxes that emerge once divine being, once revelation, has been foreclosed from human life, no longer figures as a central point of reference and orientation in the world. One, once man himself has become, in this radical sense, Herrenlos, the capital H. The texture of ordinary life comes to be ruptured by a series of impossible questions that, as it were, hound human life without hopes of domestication by either the natural or human sciences. One might think in this context of the perplexity Freud expressed in, in civilization and its discontents with respect to the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself. For Freud, love of neighbor appears as bizarre and mysterious as the spectacle of the seven dogs dancing to a music that seems to come from nowhere, as the appearance of food <clears throat> that seems to come from nowhere, as the appearance of food for a dog whose ontology has no place for human being and who bark and howl into an empty sky, einen herrenlosen Himmel. Um, okay. As I've noted, the narrator dog in Kafka's story considers himself to be poorly trained and without special talent for the researches he undertakes. He later speaks of his lack of propensity, this is him, for science, scant intellectual power, poor memory, and above all, inability to focus consistently on a scientific goal. Nonetheless, he devises a series of experiments meant to grasp the causal chain that leads to the appearance of food, to catch it in action, as it were. After several uh, efforts with uncertain outcomes, he decides to undertake a, his most radical experiment, to withdraw from the society of his fellow dogs, and more importantly, to fast, as if only the most radical ascetic practice, starvation, could clear the space for true knowledge about what keeps, keeps dog kind alive. And of course, something, vast, what keeps mankind alive? Okay, what keeps dog kind alive? I th you need a little entertainment at this point in the conference. Um, at this point, where our canine hunger artist, the name of another story by Kafka, has reduced himself to a minimum of bare life, we might say it's a life in the neighborhood of zero, he awakens to find himself confronted by another dog who demands that he remove himself from the area. In the course of the dialogue that ensues, the strange do dog declares his breed, I'm not to say whether it's a breed or his profession, um, I am a hunter, and continues to insist that our narrator dog is interfering with his work and must leave. At a point of stalemate, something remarkable occurs. That, though the narrator dog will later attribute it to his, quote, overstimulation at the time, nevertheless had a certain grandeur and is the sole reality even if only an apparent reality that I salvaged and brought back into this world from the time of my fast. It was a moment of ecstasy accompanied by, quote, infinite anxiety and shame produced by the second encounter with music ex nihilo. Quote, I noticed though through intangible details that from the depths of his chest, this dog was getting ready to sing. Though the hunting dog appears to remain silent, a music emerges nonetheless. What I seemed to perceive was that the dog was already singing without his being aware of it. No, more than that, that the melody detached from him was floating through the air and past him according to its own laws as if he no longer had, had any part in it floating at me, aimed only at me. By this point in the story, the reader is already clued in, already prepared to attribute music not to the narrator dog's hypersensitivity brought on by fasting, but rather to human hunters blowing their hunting horns. And though this musical epiphany remains empty of content, the narrator dog, as already noted, nonetheless registers its uncanny force as an interpolation in addressed to him only, now as a kind of overwhelming Orphic voice. And here one thinks, of course, as the, uh, the man standing before the law um, and learns that the, the gate was meant only for him. Quote, I could not resist the melody that the dog now quickly seemed to adopt as his own. It grew stronger. There may have been no limits to its power to increase. It was already on the verge of shattering my eardrums. Schon jetzt sprengte sie mir fast das Gehör. 
But the worst of it was that it seemed to be there for my sake alone. This voice, whose sublimity made the, sublimi sublimity made the woods grow silent for my sake alone. At this point, it is hard, at least for me, not to hear in this voice resonances with the debate between Walter Benjamin and Gershom Scholem concerning the status of revelation in Kafka's writings. The central point of contention between the two friends concerns the status of the theological trace elements in Kafka's writings. This, uh, Scholem insists that Kafka's work is suffused with the radiance of revelation, but a revelation, as he puts it, quote, seen from this perspective in which it is returned to its own nothingness. Sholem later characterizes this nothingness of revelation as, quote, a state in which revelation appears to be without meaning, in which it still asserts itself, in which it has validity but no significance. In dem sie gilt, aber nicht bedeutet. So it has, it asserts itself, it has validity, but empty of content. A revelation, this is again um, Sholem, reduced to the zero point of its own content, so to speak. For Kafka, what I said with respect to Freud's relation to the commandment of neighbor love, thus needs a slight but important revision. A divine commandment is one that only truly carries force for a person of faith, for someone who recognizes the word of God in the commandment. Kafka, however, seems to offer another possibility, namely that it is possible to register the force of a commandment, the content of which approaches zero. Um, and I think this is kind of in part what I think Slava was getting, the need for a master. You need this bit, um, even if it's empty. But this is also, I think, you know, the point which, where we, the gates are open to all kinds of empty spirituality. Um, the canine version of this nichts der Offenbarung, this nothing of revelation com conveyed by a disembodied voice, a floating signifier of, trans of transcendence that could nonetheless take residence in a particular dog, become the music of the other in it, leads to a new, a new turn in the researches of the narrator dog. After the second musical encounter of the story, his second musik trauma, he feels new life entering his body and more importantly, a new sense of his proper vocation. You could say his, uh, his Berufsarbeit, his labor in the calling. Um, a call to engage, uh, engage in the new branch of scientific research, musicology. Call it Musikwissenschaft als Beruf. More importantly, he finally realizes that the science of nutrition and the science of music overlap at a crucial juncture, one about which he already had some inklings at the time of his first musical encounter. Quote, of course, there is some overlap between the two sciences, ein Grenzgebiet der beiden Wissenschaften, that even then aroused my suspicions. I mean the doctrine of the song that calls down, calls down food from above. Again, the straightforward reading would be that the various sorts of vocalizations produced by domestic animals can move their masters to feed them. The mystery here is, of course, that it is a mystery for the dogs how this works once the domestic sphere has become herrenlos. These last thoughts about the borders, border zone of the two sciences lead immediately to the narrator dog's concluding words that repeat the theme of his lack of talent for proper science, but now at the very end of his autobiographical reflections, he seems ready to fully embrace, his, embrace the, his, this lack as rooted in an interest in a different mode of inquiry for the development of an entirely new kind of science, a kind of uh, new canine thinking. Quote, it was my instinct that perhaps precisely for the sake of science, but a different science than is practiced today, an ultimate science, led me to the value of freedom above all else. Freedom, of course, of, of course the freedom that is possible today, a stunted growth, ein kümmerliches Gewächs, but nevertheless freedom, nevertheless a possession. At the conclusion of his inspiring reading of Kafka's can canonical text, Miladin Dolar suggests that it was Kafka's neighbor, Freud, who had already begun to develop the warp and woof, it's hard not to say the woof woof, 
of this ultimate science of at least a kind of freedom, a freedom rooted in that border territory where nutrition and music, food and voice seem to converge and diverge at the same time, where the locus of nutrition, the mouth, tongue, teeth, become by a kind of intermittent fasting, the locus of the articulation of sounds, as every child is taught one shouldn't speak with one's mouth full. Giving a psychoanalytic twist to Deleuze and Guattari's characterization of this deterritorialization of the mouth, Miladin puts it this way, quote, by speech, the mouth is de denaturalized, diverted from its uh, natural functions, seized by the signifier, and by the voice, which is but the alterity of the signifier. The Freudian name for this deterritorialization is the drive. I'm tempted I, I, to impersonate Miladin. <laughs> well, eating can never be the same. OK, but I will do it. Um, <laughs> Eating can never be the same once the mouth has been deterritorialized. De it is seized by the drive. It turns around a new object which emerged in this operation. This is still Miladin. It keeps circumventing, circling around this eternally elusive object. End of quote. Our efforts to re-territorialize this object to integrate the alterity of the voice into our life in the space of reasons never comes off without a remainder as Miladin continues, but the secondary nature can never quite succeed, and the bit that eludes it can be pinned down as the element of the voice, this pure alterity of what is said. You might say sort of, you know, it has validity but no meaning. This is the common ground it shares with food, that in food which precisely escapes eating, the bone that gets stuck in the gullet, end of quote. According to the conceit of Kafka's story, we might say here that the drive functions as if human life had absorbed into its own flesh the negative theology that had formed the horizon of a, of a previous form of life, as if the unnameable object of that theology had now entered into the life substance of human being, inflaming its flesh. Apophantic theology thereby becomes the psychotheology of everyday life in which our satisfactions always leave something to be desired, remain at some level, as the British say, a dog's breakfast. Foucault's last lectures at the Collège de France were dedicated to, among other things, an attempt to think through the legacy of the courage of truth associated with cynicism. So this is stuff you've heard a bit about already um, from Aaron. The cynics, whose name, whatever its real origin, was understood in relation to kunikos, a word signifying dog-like, became important to Foucault because of the way in which they shifted the locus of parousia, forthright truth-telling, frankness, free-spokenness, from that true um, discourse, from, from that of true discourse and knowledge to that of the true life. So not of the truth of discourse and knowledge, but the true life. The cynics, by the very way they lived, insisted on the, quote, the permanent, difficult, and perpetually embarrassing question, that of the philosophical life, of the bios philosophicus. Whereas Foucault, all philosophy, philosophy I want to say falafel, all, I'm thinking I'm hungry. <laughs> Whereas all philosophy, <laughs> all philosophy, <laughs> all philosophy, increasingly tends to pose the question of truth-telling in terms of the conditions under which, a, under which a statement can be recognized as true, cynicism is the form of philosophy which constantly raises the question, what can a form of life be such that it practices truth-telling? The radical nature of the answer given by the cynics was sufficiently scandalous that their efforts to conduct what they took to be true life, the bios philosophicus, acquired canonical status. Uh, I'm cutting, so I'm, I'm trying to find the place where I... Yeah. To live the life of a dog was not only to be a martyr of truth in the sense of bearing witness to truth in the conduct of life, <clears throat> by embodying, by fleshing out the grimace of the true life, that's Foucault's expression, the cynic's life was meant to serve as an imperative aimed at all others to change their lives. 
So it's an interpolation. This demand, call it cynicism's tough neighbor love, was encapsulated in the formula said to have been addressed to Diogenes at Delphi to change the currency, that is, to undertake a transvaluation of values. One effect of this transvaluation was that the cynic can now lay the claim to the title of true kingship. Quote, this is Foucault, the king and the philosopher, monarchy and philosophy, monarchy and sovereignty over self are frequent themes. But in the cynics, they take a completely different form, simply because the cynics make the very simple, bold, utterly insolent assertion that the cynic himself is king. As such, Foucault continues, vis-a-vis -vis kings of the world, crown kings sitting on their thrones, he is the anti-king who shows how hollow, illusory, and precarious the monarchy of kings is. As the true yet unrecognized king, a king whose royalty remains hidden, as the, quote, king of poverty who hides his sovereignty in destitution, he becomes, as Foucault puts it, the king of derision. Though Foucault never makes the, the connection, it's hard not to hear in this brief account echoes of Richard's famous speech on the Welsh coast in Act Three of Shakespeare's Richard II. And someone referred to it in a, in, a, in a passing remark. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps deaf his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his, grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with the self and vain conceit, as if his flesh, which walls about our life, were brass impregnable and humored thus, comes at the last and with a little pin bores through his castle wall and farewell king. Foucault does indeed make use of Shakespeare to flesh out the legacy of the cynic, the cynic conception of kingship, one that includes, as we've seen, elements of derision, hiddenness, and destitution. For Foucault, it's King Lear, rather than Richard II, that best displays these elements in their royal aspect to which he adds the related themes of banishment, homelessness, and errancy. Quote, at the point of confluence of all this, you could obviously find the figure of King Lear. King Lear is the highest expression of this theme of the king of derision, the mad king, the hidden king. Noting that the play's point of departure is, quote, a story of parousia, a test of frankness, Foucault characterizes Lear's fate as, as a series of reversals. King Lear is, pre is precisely someone who is unable to recognize the truth that was there. And on the basis of this failure to recognize the truth, he in turn is unrecognized. We might say that Lear's reduction to a kind of radical creatureliness is thus presented as the broken mirror of his own kingship. And there's, there, there's a, a important scenes of, of, of Richard looking into um, a broken mirror. The, death with which the, play, the deaths with which the play ends represents for Foucault, quote, the fulfillment of his wretchedness, but a fulfillment which is at the same time the triumph and restoration of the truth itself. Um, you might say Lear's cynical, cynical redemption involves having been finally, and this is a, a cross-language pun, entleert. So he ceases to, he's, well, those of you who could hear it here. Um, in his speech, <clears throat> and now I'm moving toward the conclusion. In his speech given, okay, okay I have to say, there's a slight shift in register, so I'll take while the talk is changing. <clears throat> Thank you. 
In his speech given on the occasion of receipt of the Georg Büchner Prize in 1960, Paul Celan characterized Büchner as a poet of creaturely, creaturely life, as, quote, someone who does not forget that he speaks from the angle of inclination of his very being, his creatureliness. Dem Neigungswinkel seines Daseins, dem Neigungswinkel seiner Kreaturlichkeit. In the speech, Ceylon cites various passages from Büchner's writings that testify to this dimension, to the singular torsion of one's being, as what is ultimately at issue in poetic creation, in Dichtung, which Ceylon contrasts to Kunst. Art, we might say, is produced and consumed at the level of an individual's talents and capacities, the personality, while the writing and reception of poetry, according to Ceylon, are rooted in one's singularity in what can be revealed of and in relation to it. Um, I think of this to some extent as, as in parallel with studium and punctum in um, Barth's thinking about photography. Among the passages Ceylon, Ceylon cites are the penultimate lines of Büchner's play Dan The Death of Danton, Danton's Tod, in which the figure of Lucille, whom Ceylon refers to as die Kunstblinde, uh, someone blind to art, in a suicidal gesture at the foot of the guillotine at the Place de la Révolution, cries out, es lebe der König, long live the king. Ceylon characterizes this utterance as a counterword, das Gegenwort, that breaks with, breaks with the theatricality, the art and ar artfulness of man qua political animal. So in a certain, to go with Gregory, it's a kind of a break in the theatricality of power in some sense through, po through a Gegenwort. As Ceylon tries to clarify, <laughs> here there's no homage to monarchy or any preservable yesterday. Homage is here to the majesty of the absurd, testifying to human presence. To die Gegenwart is this mention. He further adds, and, and remember this is a speech he, um, when he got the Georg Büchner Prize, and that, ladies and gentlemen, has no fixed name once and for all time. Yet it is, I believe, poetry, Dichtung. The rhyme of Gegenwart and Gegenwart, counterword and presence, along with the use of the verb Zeugen, though rightly translated here as testifying, also signifies the act of procreation. This suggests that poetry is the site of a certain kind of natality, an emergence to presence of what with respect to the rule of socio-political classifications and statuses can only be registered as anarchic and royally, royally absurd, you might say cynically absurd. Perhaps most importantly for Ceylon, the clearing of a uniquely human gegenwart by way of a gegenwart is where poetry and politics make a kind of contact. And this is Ceylon. It is an act of freedom. It is a step. And of course, one can't but hear the resonances of the end of Kafka's story of the dog. Freedom, of course, the freedom that is possible today, a stunted growth, but nevertheless freedom, nevertheless a possession. Though I don't know, I don't know if Ceylon was thinking about, uh, I don't know if he knew of Kafka's, that story at that point, but I'm now gonna conclude with some reflections on another writer. Toward the end of Rilke's novel, The Notebooks of, Laura, of Malta Loris Brigge, we find a scene that I think Ceylon may have had in mind when he wrote those words <clears throat> about the Neigungswinkel der Kreaturlichkeit. In it, Rilke's protagonist finally encounters the blind newspaper salesman he had worked so hard at not truly observing. Quote, immediately I knew that my picture of him was worthless. His absolute abandonment, wretchedness, unlimited by any precaution or disguise, went far beyond what I had been able to imagine. I had understood nothing of the angle of his face, the Neigungswinkel seiner Haltung, not his face actually, of his comportment, nor the terror which the inside of his eyelids seemed to keep radiating into him. 
<clears throat> Malta registers this moment as a kind of ontological proof of the existence of God. Its, demonstra its demonstration takes place not by way of argument, but in and through the revelation of the creature as neighbor. Quote, my God, I thought with sudden vehemence, so you really are. There are proofs of your existence. I have forgotten them all and never wanted any. For what a huge obligation would lie in the certainty of you. And yet, that is what has just been shown to me. So I think Rilke brings here together two aspects of what it means to be observant. The capacity be, to be truly observant of one's neighbor, qua neighbor, seems to go hand in hand with a minimal sort of religious observance. Um, you have to be, in some sense, made to be observant. There's, so it's being observant is an ethical <laughs> stance. It's not simply seeing what's there. So this is, I think, what Levinas ultimately means by otherwise than being, um, being observant. But, Rilke, but for Rilke, these two modes of being observant are brought together with and by a kind of poetic observance. Here I'm tempted to say a mode of, of observance that is possible today, a stunted growth, but nevertheless observance, nevertheless a possession. Okay, that's the end, but a footnote. Since I'm in Ljubljana, <clears throat> I have to say something about Hegel since, as we learned, that's the true, the secret name of Ljubljana. <clears throat> so this was going to be the end of my talk, but being in Ljubljana, one of the capitals of Hegel studies, I have to add this. <clears throat> Much of the recent Anglo-American reception of Hegel turns on the rather persuasive thought, for me, quite persuasive thought, that our most basic perceptual awareness, the capacity to be observant of objects, <clears throat> is to be ultimately we might say absolutely grasped as being grounded in a capacity to follow rules, a capacity for norm-based activity. <clears throat> Seinsverständnis, the understanding of being, is, that is, the capacity to move in the space of reasons under a special kind of normative pressure. <clears throat> Robert Pippin puts it this way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hegel thinks of, him, thinks of thinking itself awareness of objects, intentionality itself, what I'm calling observe, uh, observational capacity, as inherently rational and so a norm, as a norm-based activity. As he continues, quote, following Kant, awareness itself is judgmentally structured, a taking to be such and such, and so inherently and unavoidably a kind of commitment and so much more like a normative pledging than a mere matter-of-fact psychological event. From this perspective, the cynical enigma elaborating in Kafka's story would appear to be dissolved in the concept of self-legislation, the historically articulated progress through which, and this is again Pippin, the supreme unavoidable authority of reason in the undertaking and executing of any human practice, social relation, and institution is fully established. Just by being absolutely supreme, supreme reason, reason had to possess an unusual self-authorizing authority. The question remains as to what remains of the voice, or better, the vocal object that haunts Kafka's text. It's palpable, the palpably missing voice of the, name, of the master the palpably missing voice of the, of the master. Has it indeed been aufgehoben in the magisterial voice of reason, a voice now animating all of our normative pledging? One might offer as a possible gegenwart to this unapologetically rationalist reading of Hegel, oh, uh, to this unapolog unapologetically rationalist reading of Hegel, in which the supreme authority of reason is seen to have been established without remainder, to come back to the remainder, Hölderlin's, Friedrich Hölderlin's use of the word aber, the but, the but, the but beauty, the but he links with a certain majesty of the absurd to the strange force of poetic utterance in the final lines of his poem Andenken. Was bleibet aber stiften die Dichter? Um, 
I'm going to say, um, Slavoj might say that this majesty stands antigonally to the normativity celebrated by the Anglo-American Hegelians. As I've noted in passing, I think that this tension between the two graduates of the Tübinger Stift, Hegel and Hölderlin, can be understood only by remaining mindful of the peculiar majesty that Freud discovered along the royal road to the unconscious dimension of our libidinal commitments, our erotic, uh, our erotic pledgings, which are not unrelated to the love of neighbor that Freud found to be so alien. But of course he was right, it is alien and it pertains to the alien. Thank you. Uh, Eric, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful talk. We already have a question uh, right over there. Yuval, one of our most keenest interviewer. Um, yes, please go ahead. Eric, thank you. This was really great and, and, and particularly eye-opening for me. And I want to sort of, uh, I don't know, reenact with you the very same Benjamin Sholem debate about this zero level of revelation, namely, is it that what we're seeing in the way you so beautifully open up this story, the disappearance of mastery or the necessity of its appearance as invisible? Namely, the disappearance of mastery would be if the dogs would see us. They would just see people, ah, okay, we see how it works. Everything is clear, but it's impossible to see because we form the very groundwork of their existence. So the only way to be seen as such, as masters, is to be invisible. So again, you know, at, at what, because you remember, that's the debate between them, right? Is this the end of it or the beginning? And I would, the way I read it, or the way I read your reading, is that this precisely shows us that significant dimension. It's only seen as invisible. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that <clears throat> at some level, I mean, this gets to actually, um, um, I, I, I think it was your question um, to Arthur's talk, um, where's theology in this political theology? And what we've been skirting around, I think, in all of this is the religious dimension, the theological dimension of the master. And, um, and of course, the, you know, the, Simply saying self-legislation, you know, authority authorizes itself, you know, da da da. You know, these are things that you know, kind of um, almost catechisms, and but they're catechisms, you know. But of you know, but I think it's there's something that I, I think Kafka brings to the the fore in this story, a kind of the um, just how strange it is to how strange it is to live a life without a dimension, a region of being that, you know, had always been there. And suddenly, you know, it's the problem of the enlightenment. And suddenly, you, you know, it's, you know, you do it yourself, you authorize yourself. And so the question is, in what way does this dimension lurk? You know, as a creep, you know, does it lurk in the back? And I think that um, Kafka's story and I think what, you know, Miladin's, you know, um, way of pushing, you know, Kafka into the neighborhood of Freud around this, uh, into, you know, around the science of freedom um, has to do with recognizing the necessity of thinking theology, of, of thinking in some ways of a new thinking that involves theology even as radically attenuated. So um, I, I don't know, but that of course, you know, as I say, it raises the problem of, you know, all kinds of, you know, vacant spirituality or the, you know, you know, volunt you know in, that's in the religious sphere or volunteers, volunteerism in the political sphere, decisionism. And so I think there's some, I think, in a way, what, what I think Slavoj was getting at in, in his talk was trying to find the way in which there's still a, you know, a still a need and a place for the master. And I think, you know, Slavoj's way, you know, the, the pressure he feels to think that clearly has something to do with religion. And I think that has a lot to do with Slavoj's, you know, 
you know, deep relationship to, the, you know, religious traditions or to the, you know, the, the place of theology. And I share that. Um, and I think Kafka shared it. And I think Shalom, to some extent, um, I think was maybe more closer to Benjamin, at least on this point, um, uh, closer to Kafka than Benjamin. In many other ways, Benjamin, I think, gets um, Kafka, you know, you know, is a better reader of Kafka. But I, th you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think, um, and also, if anyone, you know, if you've, I mean, do you have a dog? Have you ever had a dog? Um, I have a dog. Yeah, I mean, I have to see a man about a dog. I mean, there's no way in which our, in our visibility to them renders us, renders them indifferent to us, you know. No. No, okay. Um, he doesn't have a to dog. To my dog, I am invisible. Um, no, but I, I know what you're getting, but I, I, I think there's, I, there's a break here. And the break, I think Kafka is trying to really just see the, the Bruchstelle. He calls it a Bruchstelle, a, a, a locus of a break. And the question is whether that's also the locus of, of, free, of freedom. Now, that's clearly the Enlightenment promise, but that's not Kafka's view. That, that he's not simply just a thinker of the Enlightenment or the, you know, the, you know, or Pippin. You know, you know, it, there's some, there's a, pro, there's a problem there that requires a new thinking. And if it's not going to be religion, if it's not going to be a return to religion, the question is, I think that, you know, it, it, in Ljubljana, it seems to be some convergence of philosophy and psychoanalysis. Okay, that's one way of, let's say, and the drive is the encircling of the Bruchstelle. So, you know, so we develop new language, new thinking around a Bruchstelle that is not simply, you know, complacent with the, 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 the notion of the self-authorization of authority. So there has to be a place of somehow this object, you know, the remainder. You know, in a way this was the, you know, my question to Arthur about the remainder of sort of, you know, a kind of bare life rather than a kind of Derridian infinite self-divisibility of power. Something that, you know, gets stuck there, something that actually enables it. That's not divisible. Um, so there's the problem of the, you know, the, the non-divisible in the infinite divisibility of power. And, um, and I think that's in a certain sense to some extent, you know, the, the, the point of, uh, one of the points of contention between the, let's say, the Chicago, Pittsburgh, Leipzig, Hegel, and the Ljubljana Hegel. Um, now, I, I kind of, I'm very close friends with some, you know, with Pippin, and obviously my people are here. And I live in Chicago, you know, so I'm very torn, you know, and, you know. Um, As are you know. many of us. So, um, more questions? Yes, Simon has another question. Uh, I have to say, just when I, for the first time I came to uh, Ljubljana and gave a talk, we went to a dinner and um, Milan said, you know, put um, Simon right in front of me and said, you have to talk to Simon. And this brilliant guy, and, and he proceeded to interrogate me, like in, in such an intense way that I just realized, what? So, so, so I, I will this? count this as trying to avoid more interrogation. No, I just yes, go straight I'm putting, to interrogation. I'm, I'm, I'm you're you're time. avoiding interrogation. Okay. Interrogation. So uh, thank you for the talk, but I really do have to say that I completely disagree with you. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see, you knew that. You know, and um, from the very beginning. Um, so even, um, even at the point of entry, which was actually a kind of a, um, like, Getting, getting a proper footing be, before you be, began your talk, your text. And I think I, I, I have a theory. I mean, wh where the problem might lie with, uh, you know, self-identifying in relation to one's pet nowadays, especially dogs. Uh, so you said master is a no-go, owner is a no-go, mommy and daddy is kind of weird and creepy. Um, so there's a certain deadlock there, a deadlock of naming. And I think it has to be somehow related to the phenomenon, especially in the US, where you can't really buy a pet. You have to rescue it. So I think there's a kind of a savior complex behind it that then 
has, you know, that, that needs to be disavowed. And one way of doing it is to, you know, to simply not have words with which to describe your own position in relation to it. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, I, I, I truly believe that, I mean, it might be a very specific American thing. I don't know that um, in Europe um, there's such a, such a, you know, uh, such a, such an inclination to, to, to rescue animals and the world as, as it exists in the state. So I, this is the, yeah. just well, the first I one. Can say, from now on, I could say, when somebody says, is that your dog? No, I'm, I'm the savior. <laughs> I'm the savior. Right, that's but no master. But, but I do have to say, people buy dogs all the time. There is, and there's more and more, the, the, breed, the industry of <clears throat> The, the Labradoodle, the Bernadies doodle, they're constantly creating new doodles, you know, because um, cause, um, poodles are, you know, hypoallergenic, so people who want dogs, but they're allergic to dogs, so, but they don't want a poodle, you know, they, they, there are these, you know, and they cost thousands of dollars, and they're everywhere, and they come and go as fads. The French Bulldog, the, um, the, um, the, the, Af the South African Ridgeback, um, now it's the it's the um, the corky, you know. Before the queen died, it, you know, but and these are thousands of dollars, and they're everywhere. Well, these are brands, so you have to pay extra. You know, it's, that's it was your point on on Wednesday, right? That you know. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, breeding it, brands. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I have two two other points. Two and, more. Uh, one. Can, can I be really quick? I'll be really quick. Thank you. I didn't, um, so. Um, so I think reading together the Kafka's text and then Rilke's novel, I was reminded of a scene, in, and we talked about this scene, I think, years ago, um, where you have this family seated in, um, in a part of the house, whereas the rest of the house was re recently consumed by fire. So everyone is anxious, and any kind of hint at a at, at a existence or proximity of a fire or smell gets them excited, and they get up and they start sniffing around the room. And there's, do you remember? Uh, yes, yes, it was like his. Um, I forget which the, you know the paternal or the or the maternal home, and they visit the country manor, and yeah, and they're obsessed. With, a, a house had burned down. Yeah. Yes, and yes. there are other scenes about missing houses in the novel, but that's one of them. So um, I just want to kind of um, kind of propose an interpretation, a, a different interpretation. And, and, and there's a line in that once that starts happening, um, somebody, a family member says, "Hush, be quiet." And, and then the line is, um, "Madam or whatever, mother or whatever, smells with her ears." Hmm. So everybody has to be quiet so that she can kind of hmm. pin down the smell. So I think this correlation between smells and ears is interesting. And in the case of the musical dogs, I think a similar claim could be made. Um, not smelling with their ears, but are kind of uh, listening with their noses. And this strikes me when I look at dogs playing together, that there is a kind of... Uh, musicality to the way they smell about the territory. So I think perhaps the, the smell might be the key to, you know, this juncture of the two sciences. And now just the question, because I don't remember exactly what the, what the phrase is in Kafka's text. So you spoke of a break and the need of a break that actually... No, the uh, word is eine Bruchstelle. I Bruchstelle. Mean, he, he notes so a place the dog, of the break. He doesn't so. say it needs. He says, I realize that the, the, the problem with the, with that he's discovering in dogdom is not contingent and empirically discoverable, it's constitutive, and he calls it a Bruchstelle. Right, right. But I meant, uh, meant to ask you, because I, I, I clearly have no idea, but um, so um, do, you, do you conceive of this as a kind of a lucky break and as an instance ah. of freedom? Or on the other hand, does this break pertain to, some, to, to the development of s the science of freedom? So there's a difference between enacting freedom and then developing a science of freedom. That's Simon, a great thank question. you for your questions. Yeah, I'm, um, I, I don't have, I mean, you're the, 
I mean, we have to, I have to wait for the translation of your book, for you, the English version of your book on smell to come out. To, um, so I don't have, um, I, I don't really know what to say about that, you know, in, in, in the context of the story or about, you know, the life of dogs. But the last question is really, uh, you know, urgent. Um, and that does seem to be the ultimate wager of the story, that the, the crack in the being of the dogs, that the lack of the, you know, of a place of providence, of a concept, you know, a missing signifier, let's say providence, um, turns out to generate the possibility of a new kind of science. But it's a different, but it's not, it's, yeah. It, and that, you know, that would be the hopeful reading of the story. And I think that's, you know, that's certainly the reading, you know, that I think Miladin suggests by bringing Kafka um, in proximity to psychoanalysis. Um, that it is, you know, that the, um, you know, the constitutive um, uh, 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 dysfunction is, you know, is the condition of possibility of, you know, of a new, of concept of, of new kinds of life, of new forms of life that also, you know, involve new, new thinking, you know, new, not, you know, where let's say what looks like a, um, a limit um, becomes an enabling condition of thinking. And, and I think what I, what I, to some extent, what was trying to get at was that I think that's, that's what Ceylon is saying poetry is, that poetic thinking is in a certain, has a relation to the drive as the encirclement of, you know, of, of a Bruchstelle, but it does so through a surplus of signification. It's a little bit like um, Frauke's question about the relationship between the, the face and the proliferation of adjectives, simil, you know, metaphors. So there, in a way, the um, something that you could say, there's a punctum in the face, a point in the face that, that generate a Bruchstelle. I think that's, you know, you could say it's a, a weird Levinasian thing. There's something in the face that's not describable. It's apophantic, you know, it's, it's you you have to encircle it, and with a surplus of signification. So there's a concept, there's a proliferation of language, um, but the language it's not just language. As a, it's I mean I think that Ceylon is saying it's poetic language. That is it has a certain precision. It has a certain not any word will do. Um, I've been in, in in the midst of trying to read for the you know the umpteenth time. The man without qualities. I've tried so many times, and I just can't get through it. And now I'm trying again. And 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 there, Musil tr talks about essayism in a way. The you know the project of the book itself is some way of uh, is some sort of convergence of what he calls Genauigkeit and Unbestimmtheit. That is a kind of a constitutive indeterminacy and linguistic precision. And the novel just proliferates similes. It's just, it's one, and they seem incredibly precise, but at the end you don't know exactly what is, is been named, but you've traveled somewhere. You've, you've come closer to something, but you can't say exactly what it is. We'll allow one more question. Uh, Henrik? Thank you very much. Uh, I just had a, a thought I might want to should, uh, here, if you have any spontaneous reaction to this, I just was thinking about Laika, the space dog. Uh, I mean, is there some kind of symbolic meaning of this that you, in a way, Laika was sort of opening a new field of research in a way on behalf of humanity going to space and was sacrificed uh, for this, for its uh, complete naive trust in the benevolence of its masters probably, I imagine. So, uh, n so the dog is the savior, Not, you know, you know, sacrificed, in, you know, sacrificed on the rocket, and you know, but then you know, it's like we're back in the realm of theology, in some sense, and sacrificial economies and so on. Um, but um, I, I, yeah, I don't really spontaneously. Es fällt mir nichts viel ein, you know. Um, so I. I that's I take that as, you know, we let it hang in the air as the music of, you know, 
of the dogs. <laughs> That's, that's absolutely fine. This has been a really long conference and we've moved from philosophy to philosophy to falafel. So <laughs> I think uh, we should probably start thinking about closing this. Thank you, Eric, for uh, this wonderful presentation. For, uh, for, for first of all, accepting the job of uh, closing the conference with your last final talk and doing a pretty pretty, pretty darn good job at it. Thank you, Thank you Eric. But that sounds like Larry David. Pretty, 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 pretty. <laughs> I hope yeah. it sounded like that. <laughs> I hope it sounded like that. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.